So Doug Casey, been there, done that. Now you're writing books about fiction. Yeah. Is that because you're going insane or what's going on? Well, look, the reason I'm writing these novels, uh, first speculator about the mining business, and you guys are basically here about the mining business. You should read that book, Speculator. It's, uh, and of course, now Drug Lord, which came out last year, where I show that our, you can be a good guy and be a drug lord. And of course, this year, we're going to complete Assassin, which is perhaps topical because there are all kinds of Antifa people that have actually said they want to kill Trump. So we're looking at the history and the techniques and the morality and the practicality of political assassination. So get those books. But uh, the reason, Marin, to answer your question, is that there are a lot of things that you cannot say in nonfiction, or you probably shouldn't say, that uh, you can say in the form of fiction. So that's the reason. And, and for the record, we're looking at you know, ways to make this into you know, a Netflix or Amazon series, which it will be one day. So that's another interesting thing because there's a lot of depth in there. So Doug, let's go back to your, uh, and then we'll get into investing and making money. I just want to make sure everyone, you know, Doug's flown across the world for this conference. You know, he came from Argentina. Um, he's doing this because he actually loves being here and educating. But give me a couple of novels, not, not nonfiction books, but novels that you believe people should read to expand their horizons on investing, speculation, geopolitics, you know, that would help them become a better, wiser investor. Yeah. Yeah, novels are easier to read in many cases than nonfiction. Because Except the colder war. Well, that's, uh, that is definitely not fiction. It is nonfiction. You know, I've been a fan of Ayn Rand ever since I read her first well, I started out with her nonfiction, uh, which is excellent, but if you haven't read uh, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, you should actually do it. Because everybody talks about what they think Ayn Rand said, but they don't, um, and of course she talks about business and all this type of thing. I'd put that there, number one. Uh, but I don't read business type fiction, frankly. I like science fiction more than anything else. Because um, even though I don't have a cell phone and I find that I'm becoming a dinosaur when it comes to actually manipulating the devices that people use today, uh, I'm a technophile and uh, most of the reading that I do is uh, either history or science. And when I read fiction, it is generally science fiction. Um, Give me your two favorite must-reads. Okay, uh, Neil Stevenson is a genius. Anything by Neil Stevenson, you can't go wrong, but my favorite by him is Diamond Age. And he wrote it 20 years ago, and it accurately predicted the way, in many ways, uh, what's happening with nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is one of five or six technologies that are all advancing at um, hyperspeed faster than the rate of Moore's Law, actually. Um, you should read that book. You should read Diamond Age. I mean, you, you'll really be doing yourself a favor and introducing yourself to a, a whole different way of thinking. So Doug, now that you've kind of made a bundle of money and, and I do a lot of investing for you in the funds and in everything we do, looking back at your career, what would have been your biggest financial mistake? Uh, not investigating something adequately before putting money in it, just throwing money at it, because this is a big problem. I've talked with a lot of other guys about this. And you get lucky in a bull market, you make a lot of money, you take the money, and you feel an obligation to reinvest the money. Very stupid. I mean, make the money and keep the money and don't put it back in the market. Number one mistake I've made. Uh, don't do that. Uh, number two uh, is um, don't hold these things too long because most, not all, but most, almost all of the stocks that you will find here, even with good people and so forth, most of them are burning matches. So you can't, don't treat them like heirlooms. Don't treat them like heirlooms. 
when you most want to buy more because it's gone up a lot, you should probably think about selling instead. So that's another mistake I've made, not being a disciplined seller. Marin is very good that way. If anything, he sells too soon. But that's better than selling too late, I promise you. So, Doug, what about picking the right broker? What advice can you give someone in the audience about picking the right mm -hmm. stockbroker? Yeah, look, I guess everybody is using uh, the Internet to execute their orders and so forth because you can do so very cheaply. The commissions are trivial uh, when you use an electronic broker. Uh, I don't do that, actually. Uh, the reason why is that most of the investing that I do is with private placements. And uh, if you get good brokers that are really wired in this, uh, they're on the street and they can show you deals that your electronic account is not going to show you and uh, give you information if the broker's on the street and knows what he's doing. So I'm willing to pay a commission for but, that extra source of information. But Doug, they are called brokers, not creators. Oh yeah, right? no, They're no. They're going to make you broke if you, f most of, j j ironically, the brokers are probably the least qualified or least educated in the financial chain and they have more influence on investment decisions than anyone else in the financial chain. So I would add, the real advantage of having a full service broker is on the warrant side. If you invest in private placements, if you can explain to the crowd about the, f the benefit of warrants and yeah. why so much of what I do focuses on warrants. Exactly, uh, and Marin has said correctly that the ideal portfolio consists of nothing but cash and warrants. And the way it works here in Canada, I'm sure you guys all know this, I'm not making any cosmic breakthrough in saying this, but all of these companies are constantly raising money because very few of them have any earnings. Very few of them even have any revenues. Forget about earnings. So they're constantly selling more shares to keep the doors open. And they do this in the form of private placements. And generally, when they do a private placement, uh, it's at a discount to the market, A, and you get a warrant, B. And the warrant can be good for anywhere from, well, as little as a year, not good, to as much as five years, which is incidentally something that Marin has pioneered. And the best kind of warrant is a five-year detachable, separately tradable warrant. So a listed and traded warrant. Exactly. And walk them through the Northern Dynasty concept. Ah, well, this is an ideal case. Uh, stock is fine, uh, an excellent basic uh, property. And uh, the Northern Dynasty property is excellent. It's gigantic in size and economics and so forth. So Marin financed that at what, 40 cents? I forget what the exact number uh, was. We did three, 39.9, 42.5, and 45. Right. And on those, the uh, stock later went to as high as, what did it get to, $5? Yeah, but four and change. But the beauty here is, is every unit you bought at 40 cents, you got a warrant, and the warrant traded as high as over $4 a share. Yeah. So if you bought the stock, just the shares, you made, let's say, 10 times your money when I wrote it up, three or four times your money if you followed Casey research, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> but with the warrant, you basically double pay yourself. So, you know, we're taking all this risk. If you're accredited, and this is something I tried to really push in my newsletter, and, you know, we broke a Toronto Stock Exchange record for number of subscribers to take where we raised over $120 million from our uh, newsletter base and we're really changing the whole industry. So the big banks don't like me because they're not getting their fees. The big brokers don't like me because they're not getting their B warrant or they call it B's and fees, broker fees and broker warrants. And all I care about is bringing us. We are the investors to have the best advantage because I really don't care what the banks and the brokers do because they don't really add that much value, in my opinion. Mm, yeah, Marin is absolutely correct. So when you're doing these financings, look at the terms of the warrant. I mean, some people will offer an 18-month half warrant. It better be a really sweet deal if that's all they're going to give you for risking your money and being tied up for four months. And also remember that management teams, when you... How many people downloaded the Katusa Research uh, guideline to a conference where you can ask all the questions, okay? Please, it's free. We did a lot of work for you. Do it. When you ask the questions, 
how much are you invested? Well, you take someone like Amir Nani that Doug and I have put millions behind. He's invested in two companies and he owns 10% of it himself at the same cost base as the investors. He's got hard dollars. A lot of the management teams have something called soft dollars, not real money, but options. And these options are at five years. So, you know, I may be the pioneer of the five-year warrant, but not really because when I would negotiate with these companies, they're like, hey, good little boy, Marin. We're going to take your money and you do your thing. We're going to wind you up like a monkey and you do your thing, but we're going to give you a two-year warrant. And I said, well, I'm not just a winded up monkey. Are your options two years? Mm. Oh, no, no, no. Our options are five years. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you get the paper and the management gets to fly around in a private jet with the, with the money you give them half yeah. the time. So I said, I will take a two-year warrant if all your options are priced at the same price as my warrant and the same timeline as my warrants. You should see how fast I get that five-year warrant. Right? Anyway, ideally, that's the best way to invest in the market. But in order to get into those deals, you got, you're basically either going to have to be next to a, a really good broker that beats the bushes for those deals or get to know these companies or I don't do this at KC Research but Marin does uh, sign up for his newsletter and get into those deals it's not cheap but uh, well it is Doug, cheap, actually it is cheap it is cheap actually it's about value yeah it, it is it's Marin Marin's not shy about the pricing 15 grand a year for the Katusa Club if you can get in but it's worth it. This is how much money Doug's made. It's not 15 grand, it's 35 grand membership. Oh, is it? I don't know. I don't. But I then don't, I got my newsletter, which I, is a different I, price. I, I just send the money in. So now, Doug, what brokerage firms would you say people should research and interview people? Like, I think Haywood is one people should look at, Raymond yeah. James, BMO. Uh, that, that's three. Are there any others you like and use or would recommend? Well, I have an account with Sprott in the US, just because Rick is an old buddy of mine. We've been friends for 30 years. So, uh, yeah. But that sounds kind of like your charity, the way you just said that. <laughs> we've had some good deals and some bad deals. <laughs> like all of us, trust me, we've all lost a lot of money. We try to make money. Uh, is there any other firms in for focused on resources other than those four we mentioned that you think people should maybe phone up and interview a broker? No, nobody that I can think of. Okay. Now, how does Doug Casey manage his risk mitigation? Uh, not well. Uh, not well. But, um, you know, you want to take some off because some of these deals will blow up for all kinds of reasons. So uh, take your money off the table pretty soon after the thing. Uh, so do as you say, not do as you do. That's right. And so I'll uh, share an interesting Doug Casey story that has been re repeated. There's patterns to success and patterns to bad habits. And um, just recently, Doug and I, um, when we went out to the Boeing plant, we invested in this little junior. And Doug and I take equal positions in companies. And Doug owned about, I don't know, 9% of the company. You invested a couple hundred grand. It's up six, seven, eight times and Doug doesn't know where his certs are. No, I couldn't find them. I didn't, I actually didn't know where the damn certs were. But this is the best part of the story. This was just two months ago. We went through the same exercise a year and a half ago on the same company. And he had um, over a million dollars sitting there. I'm like, Doug, make sure you take some money off the table. He goes, I don't know where my certs are. And you found them eventually because we found through the trace at a brokerage firm that you didn't even know you had a brokerage account. Not only that, I had something at Haywood that I'd forgotten that I had that was another. Oh, that was Altera. So Doug and yeah. I are at a dinner Crazy. and Doug had a million dollars in Altera that he didn't remember that he had at Haywood. He goes, we're sitting beside a dinner. I go, Doug, that was a nice score. Eh? He goes, oh, you didn't put me in that. I go, what are you talking about? It's in your Haywood account. Yeah. So please, when you buy stuff, actively manage your portfolio because the stockbroker, as important as you think you are, unless you're in that top 20% of his assets under management, he's not going to be phoning you to take your money off the table. You have to be responsible for your own portfolio, when to buy and sell. Yeah, because when a bear market comes, you know how ugly it can be, and you don't want to be in a position of looking under the uh, couches, cushions for nickels and dimes because you can't find the rest of your money. 
Okay, so the last few minutes are questions to Doug Casey, and I appreciate Doug flying around the world for this show. Um, the microphone's there. Please don't be shy. Doug, you have no fans. Nobody's asking any questions. Uh, listen, everybody here knows that there are no cosmic answers that can be given to almost any question. So are there any questions I, here I respect for Doug? your wisdom. Or are you guys just shy? There's a question. People are usually shy. Do you own any cryptocurrencies? I do. Uh, I was uh, given a Bitcoin, a physical Bitcoin, which exists incidentally, back in 2013. And uh, it was worth about $13, $14 at the time. I bought the guy lunch and he said, here, have one of these. I still have that Bitcoin today, incidentally. Uh, and uh, this last summer, I started um, buying these things and they've treated me very very well and I've also gotten into a, a couple of Bitcoin mining companies so which ones hive I've got a big position in hive that I took in also in early in last summer and um, also the one that you just financed Marin which sounds like it's going to be almost as good a deal but it's late in the day for these things and that I one's mean, called fortress blockchain yes so, um, yeah, I, I got involved in those, and I got involved in the marijuana space also. Can uh, you talk about what you're doing with John McAfee, or is it too early? Uh, yeah, you know who John McAfee is, who the founder of, he, he was the original guy to uh, develop antiviral um, software for computers. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. And he's something of a wild man. If you go on YouTube and you uh, put in John McAfee, you'll, you'll find that he's, uh, he's fun to hang around with. So uh, John and I are going off to uh, the Solomon Islands uh, about a month from now on a wild and crazy adventure. But um, There might be a blockchain deal out of it. Well, there might be. I mean, he personally thinks that uh, Bitcoin is going to a million dollars, but... Uh, I think he's smoking something. The marijuana that you're selling him? Well, <laughs> that's right. I, I think it's late in the game for, for these cryptocurrencies. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So some names of brokers within the brokerage firms. So I can only name the ones that I have dealt with. I'll give you a bunch of names. At BMO, there's David Zadak that I think is really good. Um, at Haywood, you've got guys like Nash Jiwa, David Elliott, um, uh, David Lyle, John Tognetti. These are established players. The well, problem uh, with them is yeah. they, they don't take certain accounts, yeah. so you, it, it's difficult. At Raymond James, you've got Seth Allen is a powerhouse. Um, those are just the ones off my head, but there's lots, right? There's some of the younger guys. Um, uh, the one who used to work with uh, Nash, Jonathan, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, he's a good name. That at, you know. at Haywood, I, I've always found uh, Scott Hunter, who was Bob Hunter, who founded the Hunter Dickinson Group. That's his son, and Scott's a stand-up guy. I like yep. him. He's good solid guy. and he's honest. And they're all around here, right? And you'll yeah. meet them through companies. And there's something you might want to ask the companies that you're investing in. Another strategic way, like we did in our work group, ask the companies which brokers are in their deal because they know the trading of the stock. And if you want to buy a position, you can buy a cross at perhaps maybe a little bit of discount so you can buy a bigger chunk at one price rather than buying 5,000 share blocks and running the, so you're not the market, right? So there's strategies to buying stocks too. So, you know, you've you got to be prepared. Yeah. Hey, Terry Solomon's here. He's a legend in the business from the brokerage side. Terry, why don't you stand up? He's the one who brokered the deal between Pan American and uh, New Pacific, which was one of Frank's, uh, Frank Holmes' top picks. So he's legendary with the Salmon Partners. Oh, yeah. And it, it, it can accord. Cam Curry is um, yeah. very he, he's knowledgeable. He's a connected guy. Very yeah, knowledgeable, right. very connected. Yep. So ask the companies and you'll, you'll find that way. Terry, what question do you have for Doug Casey? I love putting these veteran industry giants on the spot.
And this will be the last question of the night, or this workshop. Hey, we have that 12 o'clock meeting, eh? Thank you, uh, Marin, for your kind words. Uh, so, Doug, um, what do you feel uh, is the best commodity sector to invest in today? Copper, gold? Mm. Well, you put your finger on it because everything in the whole world today is overpriced. And you'd think that that would be metaphysically impossible for everything to be overpriced. So, um, you know, I think it, I, I don't want to be in the general stock market. Absolutely don't want to be in anything like bonds. That's a hyper bubble. Real estate here in Vancouver. I mean, listen, I wish I'd never sold my house in Vancouver. I tripled my money 20 years ago, and if I'd held on it today, I would have gotten another five to one on the thing. So don't Probably ask like me about 25 to one. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me about Vancouver real estate, but I wouldn't be a buyer at this point. So what can you buy? The only things that are cheap are commodities, and the metals, which you mentioned, are one of them. Nobody knows, nobody cares. They all peaked seven years ago in 2011. It's been a long, ugly bear market. So that the metals and the metal stocks are actually very cheap. The other thing is agricultural commodities, also commodities, are very, very cheap. Now, there are other things like uh, the shipping stocks. They're absolutely in the toilet. The offshore drilling stocks, you look at their charts, it looks like a an aircraft that's been hit by, by flak. I mean, those two industries are both very interesting. They're not going to go away. Uh, but what's your favorite commodity in the, in the metal space? In the metal space? Uh, actually, I hate to say this because the guys that promote silver tend to be kind of religious nuts. But uh, actually, silver. I think in real terms, silver is once again very, very cheap. And... Um, the fundamentals are better than gold. It's different than gold for different reasons. So if I had to put my finger on one metallic commodity, well, uranium is a metallic commodity. That's the other one. Silver and uranium. Interesting. In our fund, we own a lot of uh, New, Paci <coughs> uh, New Pacific, which is Terry brokered the deal, actually. And they've got a massive, massive project in Bolivia that I think is going to attract a lot of attention. And Silver Corp is pretty cheap, too. You never bet against Rui. Uh, yeah, yes. And, of course, there are all these, all these I think we're done. little weird metals, but they're very hard to invest in. we got the next company coming up. Thank you very much. <laughs>